Well, good morning, Christ Church. It's so good to be with you this morning. As Chet said, we have a lot of events coming up, and you might have gotten one of these flyers when you came in today, and we just want to encourage you to hand these out. We really want people to come and see what it's like here at West Campus. We want them to come and see a God that is so much greater than they might have thought. So this um, is a QR code to our link tree. It's going to invite them to social media. So would you help us out and just uh, pass these out? Well, I am excited to share this message with you today. But before I do, let me open, open us up in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, you are a good and mighty God. You know each one of us by name. You know our hearts and exactly where we're at. You are a God of love and power, and you give us that power as well. Lord, I pray that um, as we hear your word today, that you would spark a fire inside of us and that we would leave here encouraged and um, that we would grow into the people that you have called us to be. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, at the beginning of every year, we as staff, we like to pick out um, a word to focus on. Some of my coworkers have picked uh, words like listen. They want to hear where God is speaking to them. I've heard words like discipline. Like they want to grow healthy in their habits. My word for the year is focus. And I thought it would be super fun and creative if I focused on words that started with the letter F so it helped me remember. So I was going to focus on my faith and on my friends and on my family and on my fitness and on my finances. And as you can see... <laughs> I'm trying to focus on a lot of things. And it's around this time of year that I'm getting a little tired. We're only a couple months in, and this girl's feeling depleted. And I'm wondering if you thought that, too. Like this year, you were like, I'm going to get healthier. I'm going to keep eating the donuts at the back of the church. I didn't bring them today for you, okay? (laughs) Or maybe you thought, like, I want to grow closer to God this year. I'm going to read the Bible more. And you find that you're just not doing it. You're having a hard time fitting it into your life. See, when we're in these seasons, when we're overwhelmed and we're depleted, this is why I love God. This is why I love scripture. It says that this isn't just a book, but it's the living and active word of God, and it applies to your life and my life just as much today as it did back then. So if you started this year on fire, now you're not. <laughs> I just pray that as we read these verses, that it would just spark that fire in you today. And we're going to look at the book, 2 Timothy, chapter 1, and we're going to start at verse 3. But before we dive in, I just want to give you a little context. So the Apostle Paul is writing this letter to this young leader, Timothy, who is at the church of Ephesus. And he's discouraged. And these two men, they started ministry together as like a mentee-mentor relationship, and it really developed and grew into a father-son type of relationship. And at this time, Paul, he's in Rome, in prison. So not only is he writing to encourage this young leader who he loved, he's writing this letter to pass on the torch of everything he knew, because he knew more than likely His time here on earth was coming to an end, and he was going to be executed. So I want to start at verse 3. It says, I thank God, whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois, And your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And I want to break these verses down to us today in three parts. God's legacy. God's gift. And God's spirit. Now Paul is reminding Timothy where he comes from. He says, you have a generational faith. It came from your grandmother to your mother, and now it lives in you. 
you ever find yourself like blurting something out and you think, oh, I sound like my mom? <laughs> Turning into my dad. Yeah, I've picked up some traits from my parents. This is why my husband does not like to play sports with me. I'm competitive. <laughs> and, and I don't like to lose. And see, this is where we just disagree because he thinks that playing games, it should be fun. <laughs> I know you're like me, I can tell. It is fun when you win. That's why we play the games, right? Thanks, Dad. <laughs> I got it from him. <laughs> Oh, but really, um, playing games or sports or cars in our house, it usually doesn't go well because my youngest daughter has picked this up, and um, it usually ends in tears when she loses, and I win. <laughs> but really, knowingly or unknowingly, we are passing something on to our next generation. My family had a tough week this past week. My Nana, who I love and adore, she went home to be with the Lord. And as sad and heartbreaking and painful as this was, she was surrounded by so much love. And it was a love that she instilled in each one of her kids. It's a love that I hope to pass on to my children. When I look at my aunts and my uncles, I will always see her. And this is a legacy that she left behind. And when I look at my dad, he's always had this, like, growth mindset. Like, he's always wanted to be a better version of himself, a better dad, a better father. And I don't think he knows, but that's something that I've looked up to. And my mom, she is feisty. <laughs> my husband laughed. <laughs> But she is so strong, and I have rarely seen this woman quit at anything. These are what they've passed on to me. This is the legacy that they're leaving. And I think, like, what kind of legacy do we want to leave? And for me, it's not winning a game of pickleball against my coworker, whose name rhymes with Schmet Schmietler. And then bragging about it for a couple days. I said I was competitive. I didn't say I was humble. It actually happened, but who's counting? But really, winning at the end of the day is a generation that continues this sincere faith. Timothy was reminding, or Paul was reminding Timothy, hey, you have this sincere faith. And that word sincere, it means genuine, authentic. It was real. And it's a faith that I hope that we pass, hope to pass to our next generations. When I, when I look at my daughters, I just hope that in their lives, when they're struggling, they look to Christ because it's something that their mom saw them do. And I want to encourage you, if you are a first generation of faith, keep pushing. Keep taking one step at a time. Your family and friends might think you're crazy crazy. But pursuing a faith in Christ is one of the most important gifts that you can give your child. And when I'm in this season where I'm tired and cranky, I can often bring it to my family and to my coworkers and into my job. But we can fix what's broken in us. And here's the thing, God is going to give us something to help us carry on our legacy. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse said, 10 says that God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Have you ever gotten like a really cool gift? And I mean, like, it's a gift you had no idea that you needed in your life. I have. Um, I'm going to share something. I'm under the understanding that you and I, we don't judge each other. Okay. It's going to go well. Um, I have a tendency to lose. I have a tendency to misplace. I misplace them. I misplace my keys and my phone often. <laughs> it's who I am. And a couple years ago, I had received the best gift I had ever gotten. It was a tile. 
And if you don't know what a tile is, it's this little device, and it hooks up to your keychain. And when you can't find your keys, you go to your little app, you press the button, and your keys will start singing to you. And then, here's the thing, if I lose my phone, I hit that little button on my keychain, and my phone sings to me, and I can find it. This was a game changer. I used this thing daily. It made my life so much easier. But listen, if when we are a follower of Christ, God has gifted you something special, and it's going to bless your life and the people's lives around you. He gives a piece of his character, of who he is, his goodness, and it's inside of each and every one of us. He gives us gifts like teaching. Are you someone that you love reading the Bible, you love learning? Maybe God wants you to share that and teach others. Maybe God's given you the gift of mercy. Is it easy for you to sit with somebody who's hurting and just love them and be there for them? Maybe you have that gift. Somebody's laughing right now, not them. (laughs) Maybe you have the gift of giving. Are you a generous person? Could you use what you have to bless the people around you? I'm going to be honest. I had a really, really hard time believing that God could gift me. I would think, like, I'm so broken. I don't have anything to offer. Why would God want to give me anything? I thought I had to earn it. But here's the beauty of God. We don't have to earn these gifts. We don't have to earn his love. When I got that tile, I used the heck out of that baby. I said, thank you. I didn't ask if I could pay them back for it. I didn't ask how much it was. I received it, and I used it. There's a couple important things that I think we should know about our spiritual gifts. One, we need to know what they are. And like I said, that comes from an understanding of like who we are, knowing like where we're gifted. But if you don't know, this week we're going to send um, a link in our email, and it, you can have access to taking a spiritual test assessment. And I recommend you do it. You could also join our Connect class. We dive into who God is, who you are, and where we think he's gifted you. And if you're not sure where you're gifted, you could ask someone in the church that you know and trust. Because I guarantee you, they're going to say it a lot quicker than you might recognize it in yourself. Another thing that I think is important for us to know about our spiritual gifts is that when we are running low, we have to fan into flame the, the gifts that God has given us. To make um, a fire, you have to have heat and fuel and oxygen. And it starts small. You give it some oxygen. You give it that fuel, and that baby grows. And when our fire is low, there's three things that we can do. One, we can rest. Can we just be kind to ourselves and schedule out time just to stop and pause? And then the second thing that we can do is we can pray. And prayer is simply talking to God. And there's power in it. And it doesn't have to be fancy. When I'm feeling low and tired, here's my prayer. You can use it. I'm going to share it with you. Lord, I am tired. Help. Amen. And it works. (laughs) But really, it doesn't have to be fancy. It's from the heart. God knows where we're at, and he meets us there. The third thing I think that is important for us to know about our gifts is that they're meant to be grown. God doesn't give us these wonderful gifts for us to tuck them in a box, put a little bow on it, put it on the shelves, and just stare at it. That was nice. Our gifts are meant to be grown, church. And I think sometimes we don't use these gifts because of fear. Fear is a killer. (laughs) Verse 7 says that God gave us a spirit, not of fear, 
but of power and love and self-control. And this word self-control can also be translated to a sound mind. Listen, fear is not from God. Fear is an emotion. It is not our identity. And if we're not careful, it's going to limit us. See, God, he's going to call us. He's going to challenge us. He's going to nudge us to use these gifts. And sometimes that looks like, um, have you ever just had somebody on your mind? And you're like constantly thinking about them, and you're like, oh, I should really reach out. But you're like, oh, I haven't talked to them in a while. I don't know. But then like later you find out that they could have really used a friend. God's going to nudge us. He's going to call us. Sometimes we won't use these gifts because we have a fear of adding more on to our plate. Like, I don't have time. Sometimes we have a fear of other people's opinions. Like, what are they going to say? What are they going to think? I have a fear of failing. I think God's put something on my heart, and I just don't know enough, and I don't know enough about the Bible, and you want me to get up there and talk about it, and (laughs) what if I fail? But I've heard this definition of failing, and I loved it. Failure is just learning. And I think we can all agree, as followers of Christ, we're all learning. I have never met anyone that was like, yeah, I got it together. I figured out life. If you meet them, run. (laughs) But see, we have to fan into flame these gifts that God is giving us because he did not give us a spirit of fear. See, if God's calling us to do something, he's not calling us to do it alone. He's calling us to partner with him. Because it's not about me, it's not about you, but what he's going to do through us. It's his power that lives in us. There was a man named Moses in the Bible, and (laughs) the odds were uh, stacked against him. This was an unlikely man that anyone would have thought God would use. And see, he was running from his past. He was running from the mistakes that he had made. And I can just imagine being in that place where it's like you're in this loop. Nothing good happens. Maybe he's lost his purpose. But God shows up to him. And he says, Moses. And Moses says, here I am. And God says, I want to use you. And Moses replies something that I think we might relate to. He says, who am I that you would send me? Who am I that you would use my brokenness? Who am I that you would choose? And then God replies to Moses and he says, I will certainly be with you. Moses says to him, okay, what if people don't believe me? The fear is kicking in. Okay, what are they going to say? And I love this because God shows Moses his power. And as they're having this conversation, Moses is holding his staff, and the Lord tells Moses, drop it. He drops it to the ground, and it turns into a snake. That's right. And the next verse made me laugh. It said, Moses ran. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But he, he ran from the snake, and the Lord said to him, pick it back up. And as he picked it up by the tail, it turned back into a staff. And I just love this, because this was God's power. It wasn't Moses picking up this stick that was the power. It had already been there in God, but Moses had to move to pick it up. God did the rest. Sometimes he's going to call us to move when we're afraid. Sometimes he's going to say, hey, I want you to work in your marriage. And we have to move and take those steps when we feel hurt 
over me so broken. He's going to say, hey, I want you to move in this addiction because I've got something better for you. And it's going to be scary and nobody wants to touch that snake. (laughs) But there's power when we do. This power was in Moses all along. He just didn't know he had access to it. The same power that God gives us is in us. And not only do we have a a spirit of power, but we also have a spirit of love. 1 John Chapter 4, verse 19, it says, We love because he loved us first. God loves you. If you haven't heard that in a while, I'm just going to say it. God loves you. He chose you and he called you. He loves us so much that he came from heaven to pay for our sins. And he gave his life for us. And see, when we live through this love, it is going to change us. When I live through this love, it's going to help me to love my family more. Not only did God gift us the spirit of power and love, But he gifted us with a sound mind. In this world that is so loud and so crazy and hard for us to focus, when I think about these truths of his power, I know these things to be true. As we wrap this up and as we think about our legacy, the gifts that God has given us. I just want to encourage us, can we be a church that doesn't live in fear? Can we be a church that steps out in courage? Can we be a church that helps one another to love more? And I just have these two questions that I want to ask us. The first question is, Where do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as Timothy? Maybe you're in a season where you're tired and depleted. Do you see yourself as Eunice or Lois, who wants to pour into that next generation and leave behind a sincere faith? Do you want to be like Paul? You want to be somebody that is just pouring strength and courage. See, Paul was in a bad spot. He was in prison, knowing that his time here was ending. And he was writing to this this man that he loved. He wasn't complaining, hey, it's dark. I'm hungry. I'm scared. He was telling him to keep on going, keep on moving, because he knew that God was good. Let me say a prayer for us. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you so much. Thank you so much for this time today. Thank you for your word that just equips us and reminds us that, God, you did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. That no matter what we're facing, Lord, that you are going to be there with us. It's your power that lives inside of us, not our own. Help us to lean on you and to grow so much closer to you. In Jesus' name.